All right, without any further ado, uh, this is Ann Kim with uh, Selfie or Mugshot. Hi, uh, today I'll be presenting Selfie or Mugshot, and is there a way to make it less echoey? <laughs> Hello? Hello? Okay, that's a little better. So I'll be presenting Selfie or Mugshot, and it's the idea that you can actually reconstruct genetic information from just facial information. And the TLDR is you could take a fun snapshot like this and then reconstruct genetic information and then maybe go to jail or get pwned in some other way. So who am I? Hello? I'm Ann Kim, um, and I'm a graduate student at MIT studying computer science and molecular biology. My thesis and startup work is in clinical trial optimization using federated learning and blockchain. <laughs> My hobbies include running, slacklining, learning Yaz flute, and paranoia. So everyone has a side hobby, but my side hobby is reading uh, nature genetics papers. So I was reading this fun one, and it was about genome-wide mapping of global to local genetic effects on human facial shape. So essentially, uh, connecting your facial cranial shape with genetic information. Sounds really nifty, except for the context of news today. So there's a lot of people blindly taking genetic tests, um, just trying to figure out how white they are, or like, you know, their ancestry. Um, and then you also have people who are like taking a lot of obnoxious selfies, as well as an environment where you have surveillance just all over. You know, a, a Canadian mall even. It's anarchy, right? So uh, today I'll be imparting onto you my paranoia. And I'll be first uh, giving a preface on basic uh, genetics as well as telling you about how this can be potentially abused by insurance companies or your employers as well as criminal investigators. And then also telling you, just like scoping out your paranoia and telling you, uh, you know, when will this be possible? How many sheeple do you need to like take selfies of themselves or like, you know, do Ancestry.com? And how expensive will it be to create a patsy out of you? Um, but never fear, I'll also be giving you some solutions of how you can use personal discretion, secure computation, as well as regulation in order to protect yourselves. So a little bit about my friend DNA. Um, the whole genome sequence was done in about 2003, and it's three billion uh, base pairs in your human genome. Wonderful, right? So much. But only 2% is actually useful for protein coding. And uh, between you and me, it's only like 0.4% difference. And what you're paying $200 for is 0.016% of your uh, genotype, or your whole genome, which makes up your genotype for 23andMe. But even with this small amount of DNA, you can do a bunch of stuff. You can figure out your ancestry, where you came from, missing relatives that were estranged some time ago. Uh, you can figure out genetic risk factors that are going to get you in the night. And you can also figure out future risk prediction for family planning for all your brood. Uh, genetic information ha and te techniques have advanced so much that you can actually use facial information for phenotyping. And this is especially useful for children who have different types of diseases that might not have symptoms that they can actually express to you. So you can have faster diagnosis, like diagnosis before they can actually speak. And you can also have more precise diagnosis because oftentimes with sequencing, you have a lot of genetic variants and a lot of sequencing errors. And it can be really hard to decouple the two from each other. And this is overall much cheaper because it's much cheaper to just take a photo of someone as opposed to paying like $600 for a whole genome sequence. Another benefit of genetic sequencing is potentially catching uh, criminals. So this method has been used since like 1987, and what has recently been used for for the it's been used recently for the Golden State Killer. And if you're not familiar with the talk or not familiar with the crime, um, yesterday almost humor. BJ, uh, somewhere over there, gave an excellent talk about the techniques used to actually catch him. Um, but in brief, this was a man who uh, um, had a lot of strings of murders as well as rapes between 1975 and 1986. The police had all of this DNA in this cold case, and they decided to get creative and upload it to this website called GEDmatch. And this is a website where you can upload your genetic information for free and then figure out who all your estranged relatives are. Um, the police uploaded the DNA, uh, posing as this man, and then they found all the third and fourth cousins of this man who had uploaded their own DNA. And as a result, they were able to match the suspect's DNA in order to get a warrant for his arrest. 
The techniques for doing this uh, have been done since like 1987, and it's about a one in a trillion positive or false positive rate. The methods are endless for this. You can use a polymerase chain reaction or PCR in order to amplify any like minute amount of DNA, um, and I'll use a bunch of other methods. I won't bore you with them, but the flavor of uh, investigators these days is short tandem repeats or STR. And what this is is a technique where you take all of your genetic information and instead of doing a whole sequence, because that's too expensive for criminal investigations, you just look at 13 sites, just look at 13 sites and call it a day where you can figure out um, sort of identifying them based on these 13 sites. And below you have an STR of 15 sites as well as the AML gene that tells you what gender this person was. Good enough. Let's think about a dystopian uh, scenario for all of this information, because after all, we're at DEF CON, right? So the risks of uh, DNA and identity are twofold. One, someone can frame you for a crime, make you a patsy, or two, genetic discrimination. So in order to uh, put you out as a criminal, they have to first capture your DNA, replicate enough of it, and then plant it at the scene of a crime. For genetic discrimination, we have laws like uh, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, or GINA, um, and this provisions that your insurers as well as your employers can't actually discriminate against you based on your genetic information. But could your employers actually use your photo to discriminate against you, or your insurers maybe, and reconstruct your genetic information? I don't know, getting scared yet? <laughs> So let's go through all the questions that you might be having, like, how could someone actually frame me for a crime? I've done nothing wrong. I recycle. I'm vegan. Um, how much would it actually cost? How long would it take? Can my discretion, my family's discretion, computers, or regulation protect me? <laughs> could your employers or insurers actually get away with this heinous crime? Should you actually be scared? So there are three steps for uh, framing someone for a crime. First, you have to capture their DNA. Second, you have to replicate enough of it. And third, plant it in a crime scene. So there are a lot of different sources of DNA. One is that you could actually just take a sample of their like uh, cheek or maybe some skin or some hair. Uh, potentially, you could hack into some of the databases that have one of the 15 million humans in the United States who have done uh, genotyping or genome sequencing. Or, and like this has exploded recently. Uh, in 2017, tons of people um, maximized on the Amazon Black Friday sale of like 23andMe kits. And it's estimated that about 100 million people will have had some sort of genetic testing by 2025. Another source of DNA though, believe it or not, the selfie. Now you might be wondering, how can you possibly get genetic information from just a photo of yourself? Let me science you guys. So in this really exciting paper I read in Nature, uh, these researchers took 2,329 Europeans. And you might be saying this is a very small sample. And why just Europeans? So the reason why they took so many, they took only 2,300 people and particularly chose only Europeans was because they wanted to reduce the variance, so they narrowed it down to just Europeans, and they wanted to boost the statistical significance of any signal they would get from this very small cohort. The methods that they used were stereo uh, spectral uh, photography. So what this is is that they have two cameras and it captures the depth in your face in order to get a geometry of your face. Um, what was particularly interesting about this method is that they found the most variation around your nose. Um, and using hierarchical spectral clustering, they were able to divide your face into 68, or no, not 68, 38 associated SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are sites of high variation in your genetic information. So essentially, there are like 38 sites in your face that map perfectly to uh, 38 sites in your genetic information. Well, what is the extension of this? Say, I don't know, you have like 50 million diverse people. So now you're not just talking about Europeans, you're talking about Asian people, black people, purple people, European people, and you have 50 million of these diverse people not only doing spectral imaging, which you can only capture uh, depth with, but you can also get color. And this would be captured maybe with iPhone 10 or whatever, like next generation uh, photography devices we have. And then, oh, there's a question. Yeah, is this the reason for iPhone having live photos? 
I don't think that that's their uh, initiative. I mean, I, I'm not privy to that information, but that's a good hypothesis, certainly. Um, so from all of this information, you could actually get a mapping of 50 million people's faces to their genetic information. And with that mapping, you can actually project some sort of prediction of genetic information from just a face. And the particular genetic information with this huge scale of information would be a genotype of 602,000 602, SNPs, enough to fake a 23andMe genotype. And if that's not scary enough, you can actually use this technique called imputation to reconstruct all three billion base pairs. And imputation is just a fancy statistical method where you use information about the likelihood of certain SNPs correlating with others to reconstruct the rest of your genome. So it looks like our evil mastermind has captured your DNA from just your Instagram selfie. But how do they replicate it? The cost of replication is quite high. It's 10 cents per base pair, and that really explodes when you're trying to build your genome base by base, which currently would cost around $300 billion. You could also do it with CRISPR. And with CRISPR techniques, you would get like some sort of template DNA and just edit the sites that make them unique. Recall there's like 0.4% variation, so this would cost a little cheaper, you know, measly $120 billion. Uh, there are other uh, techniques that Mr. Brimley actually um, looked at two days ago, so if you are interested, look at his talk. Um, and there's also an initiative from the George Church group as well as other uh, biologists who are actually trying to scale the human genome uh, through synthetic uh, editing. Um, your slides are saying 300 million and 120 million, not billion. Yeah, it looks like Oh, whoops. I'm sorry. It's million. Okay. <laughs> My bad. Oh, then it seems like it's much cheaper than I thought it was, but still pretty expensive. <laughs> I'm a little tired. Okay, but very expensive and potentially getting cheaper with this initiative of the Genome Project Write. And this is a way, they're using sort of the template of the uh, Human Genome Project to scale back something that was once a $1 billion uh, dollar genome sequencing project to a thousand genome, uh, which is what we currently have. And so they're trying to transfer those uh, innovations with the recreation of genetic information. Um, alternatively, even though it's not billions of dollars, millions of dollars is pretty expensive, um, alternatively, a cheaper way to get genetic information is simply to steal it uh, and just amplify it. So abandoning everything that I said about like facial recognition and like photos, what's much cheaper is to actually steal your hair or steal a cup and then amplify it using a polymerase chain reaction or PCR. <laughs> So it looks like they've captured your DNA and they've also replicated it for either millions of dollars or less than $100, less than $100 if they actually have access to your physical body. Um, and then planting it in the crime scene is, you know, use your imagination. You like bribe the, like, the cook or something, or you're sleeping with the butler and you steal their genetic information. I'm imagining your target is very rich or something, because why else? I don't know. Um, but then you plant it in the crime scene. Uh, so some of the answers to the questions of, can someone actually frame me for a crime? It would cost a lot of money currently, millions of dollars, not billions, thank you for the correction. Um, and then it would also take lots and lots of time, potentially. Um, this might be an initiative that might be like five years in the future. So if you have any sort of imminent crimes that you're planning, you'll have to wait on that. Um, should you actually be scared? That might be a religious question. Um, so addressing the other questions, can my discretion, my family's discretion, uh, computers or regulation save me? And if they can't, will my insurers and employee, employers actually get away with such a crime? Uh, so this was from the proceedings of the American Society of Microbiology, and they said, genomic surveillance is neither hype or hope nor hype, it's reality. So let's dive into this reality and figure out how to protect your DNA. There are three different ways I recommend. Discretion, secure computation, or regulation. So with discretion, you have to not only cover yourself, but also your family members. Because if your family members, including your third and fourth cousins, upload any of, your genetic, any, any of their genetic information, you're in big trouble. Um, you might be the Golden State Killer. 
Uh, so don't associate any of your DNA with your identity. So if you have to do 23andMe or Ancestry.com, I'd recommend using a pseudonym, getting the kit like shipped to a shared office space, um, doing a number of different ways to like pay for it with uh, prepaid debit cards or something, and whatever you use in order to hide your digital identity uh, when you look at your results. Um, Second, do not upload your DNA because it is subject to whatever the privacy policies are of whatever website you're using. So beware. And then try not to leave stray hairs behind because that's a really easy vector of attack. Um, Potentially, you can also consider makeup or plastic surgery. So recall that I mentioned the techniques for this was using uh, stereo uh, spectral imagery. And if you have an unusually thick beard, you might be safe until they actually learn how to like see past it with new cameras or something. Um, a fun thing to use uh, to hide your identity is makeup. So recall World War I, we have a lot of ships and they're trying to shoot other ships. So in order to hide them, we use something called dazzling. And this was a technique in order to obfuscate the speed of the ships and their exact locations. Uh, mixed success, and then World War II is obviously abandoned. But it's pretty successful for facial recognition technology. And this is just an example of CV Dazzle. <laughs> an alternative to protecting your DNA is using maybe computers. You might have your genetic information either on a website or on your own personal device. Uh, please use whatever encryption methods that you know how to handle. And then maybe if you wanted to actually peek at it, you'd have to decrypt it. That sounds pretty bad. Maybe you could use some sort of like homomorphic encryption to learn on it, or like federated learning, or some sort of hardware integrated computation where you actually store the like data and it like manages the keys for you. Say like a trusted execution environment or something. Um, alternatively, if you still want to upload those cute cat photos, but you don't want anyone to know that you have a cat, or you don't want anyone to know that your face is like a cat because you're like Hermione Granger or something, you might want to consider image poisoning using GANs or generative adversarial neural networks. And the way this works is that, say I have a face, I have a cat face, and I want to fool people, particularly uh, whoever I'm up, or the machine learning algorithm for discriminating whether it's my face or not. And fool it into thinking it's guacamole. So with a generative adversarial neural network, what you have is you have two neural networks. One is generative and one is uh, discriminative. So the first one is trying to generate uh, examples of cat photos, and the other one is trying to discern cat or guacamole. Um, and they go back and forth, and at each iteration, the generative neural network will actually make small perturbations in the image in order to fool it. And at some threshold, you'll be satisfied with this image, and it'll look fairly like a cat, but it'll actually be registered as guacamole. Uh, new Instagram filter, maybe. <laughs> So other ways of protecting your DNA is through regulation. So you have your Fourth Amendment rights. You have uh, the privacy policies of whatever company you're using. Uh, you have California's 2016 Electronic Communications Privacy Act if, you're, uh, if you live in California. And you have GINA. GINA! GINA! The Genetic Information Non-Discriminatory Discrimination Act of 2008. <laughs> so the Fourth Amendment. You have the right uh, to secure your persons. This could extend to your DNA. And you have the right against unreasonable search and seizures. So in the case of the Golden State Killer, potentially he had the right to protect his genetic information and uh, prevent it from actually having uh, some sort of unreasonable search or seizure. Um, or in any other example, that's like adversarial. Uh, you also have the terms of use and privacy policies of whatever website you're using uh, to get your genetic analysis. So this is an example of GEDmatch, the company that outed the Golden State Killer. And you can see that they do not make any promises of you know, securing your genetic information. So whoever their third cousin was who did not read the privacy policies, you know, that was on them. Uh, 23andMe is a little better, so they actually require that there has to be a warrant for you in order for them to uh, give up your genetic information. Kind of better. Um, you also have California's Electronic Communication Privacy Act. So through this act, the government can't coerce a custodian or steward of your, of your electronic information in order to uh, 
like make an arrest without a search warrant. So what this means is like for Gmail, if you put all your like emails in Gmail and the government does not have a warrant for your arrest and they ask Google and they try to coerce Google into like giving you their data, then Google doesn't have to. But obviously if they have a warrant then, you know they have everything. Um, and this could obviously extend to genetic information that is electronically stored. For Gina, this is a little better. So the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act says that it prohibits discrimination on the basis of genetic information with respect to health insurance and employment. That seems like pretty good coverage to me. Um, you know, they acknowledge that genetic information is extremely valuable, so it should be shared for insight to a certain degree, but obviously this could be abused by your insurer or employer who could see your genetic information, predict that you're going to get Huntington's disease, and doesn't want to hire you because you're at risk. Uh, the next clause, although genes are facially neutral markers, hmm. I don't think it's very neutral after the talk that I just gave. So this is quite concerning that GINA has not been updated since 2008 with these findings that were published in 2018 about how there's actually some correlation with facial information and genetic information. So uh, I will leave you with sort of a to-do of trying to fix this or uh, you know, wariness that GINA does not currently protect you with uh, you know, your face. Um, thanks. Please take no more selfies and stay paranoid. Uh, I'm Ann Kim. If you have questions, please like go to the mic and ask them, or you can also ask them, just you or something. <laughs> okay. um. Okay, from one paranoid to another, mm -hmm. um, it seems like the scenario of planting DNA in a crime is a little bit... Contrived? I mean, the really scary thing is targeted genetic attacks with chemical or biological factors that one knows are, you know, that certain segments of DNA are susceptible to. Yeah, for sure. That's definitely a concern, but, um, what? Please repeat the question. Oh, okay. So sure. So the question uh, concerned um, targeted biological attacks using, I guess, metabolites in your genetic information, right? To sort of say that you have a certain threshold for certain poisons. The problem with that, though, is that you can't target people enough. It's by threshold. Um, so you would actually target not only them, success, but also you would target anyone who has a threshold lower than them of poison. And I'm not sure how that would play out in whatever your attack would look like, but it might be like half a mall dead or something. That might implicate you in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Good question. Uh, you? Is there any uh, diseases that uh, modify genetics that selfies wouldn't really be able to do? Such as like maybe facial deformity or uh, skin? Right. So those are... Um, those are changes after genetic information, so they don't change genetic information at all. But that also reminds me of like epigenetic changes, and epigenetic changes are actually on top of your genetic information and might not necessarily come out in some of this research, unless if you have like a large enough data set and you're accounting for not only uh, genetic information, but also genetic expression in uh, um, epigenetics. Oh, Bennett. So like how much, uh, if, you, if, you, if your face was deformed, like, are there ways you can like deform your face easily that would like fool these uh, these? Yeah. So, um, so the question was: Is there a deformity that, like a facial deformity, that potentially could? Um, fool any of these genome mappers? And the answer is yes. It's any sort of nose job could potentially fool these genome mappers because a lot of the variation in your face is actually captured in your nose. And that sort of makes sense like from an evolutionary biology perspective that like, you know, a lot of this is uh, connected to how you've survived and stuff. So nose jobs. If you use nose jobs and makeup, Hollywood's doing it right. <laughs> uh, yes, Mr. Brimley? Uh, actually, to answer the fellow's other question, sure. uh, there's a study on, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, they actually took uh, Juggalo makeup and ran it through a facial recognition <laughs> software, and right now it beats it. So develop fondness for its Acon Posse. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, you? 
Yes. Uh, so all of the protections that you listed were basically from the United States. Yes. Is there any effort to make international regulations or some kind of a... Yes. So uh, the question was about international regulations. And for Europe, they have some nifty thing called GDPR. And there's actually a very specific clause that uh, talks about genetic information. But currently, in its state, it does not um, address facial information, because this is extremely new research. Um, yes? I just wanted to quickly add the, um, the legal side of things that facial, the Fourth Amendment protection for your face is that's probably not going to be that strong, because courts have this thing where they say, if it's a biometric or something that we use to identify you, then it's not protected by the Fourth Amendment. It's really bad. Oh. Okay, so to re reiterate, the Fourth Amendment does not protect you. No, well, no. <laughs> 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 it may protect you, but the court, we can't, I don't know how the courts are going to go. Oh, it, the Fourth Amendment will protect you depending on your lawyer. Folks, <laughs> <laughs> if you've got questions, you might want to use the microphone. Just a suggestion. <laughs> cool. Are you going to use the microphone? <laughs> James just asked. Okay, yes. Yeah, so the, the PCR seems like a viable attack vector at this point. I'm thinking like a biologic evil maid attack where the maid takes some of your hair, uses a $100 PCR to amplify, plants it at a crime scene. Is there anything about PCR amplified DNA that, uh, that makes it obviously different than native DNA? Oh, well, it depends on the like uh, material that they're using. And they can certainly, I th I'm pretty sure that the synthetic material that they're using and the, bio the natural material of your body is quite similar. Like, I, I don't think you can actually distinguish them, but I'll have to double check. Good question. Uh, do you want to use the mic? I'm just a oh, a comment. Methylation. Methylation? What do you mean by that? Like, PCR isn't methylated, right? Oh, yeah, OK. So there is actually there's a lot of differences. It's not only methyl. So yes, so PCR is different for a couple of different reasons from your DNA. There's not only epigenetic factors like methylation and acetylation, but there are also factors like uh, certain sugars that are attached to your DNA post-processing, or at least for certain uh, RNA and proteins that might be evident in uh, synthetic DNA. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Any any more questions about like? Oh. Sorry, it's hard to get the microphone. I was just curious. Your um, your selfie thing here uses three D facial images. Yes. Um, but you're talking about the Instagram selfie as being like a singular point of data, which obviously wouldn't have three D information. Right. Um, how reliable would it be to pull genetic information from a single picture, or would you have to correlate several to sort of? triangulate a 3D image from an entire Instagram account. Yeah, you'll have to have a lot of, pro so the question was about uh, the difference between hierarchical spectral clustering and like uh, stereo imagery as opposed to your run of the mill Instagram photo. And the answer is that although currently with like small populations and small ends, you need this stereo spectral like uh, photography. When you have enough information, you can actually have some sort of like mapping or projection from different, um, I guess, uh, not planes, but like mapping from different uh, forms of photography. So you can have the mapping of uh, these stereo images to the mapping of iPhone 10 images to the mapping of just regular photography, right? If you have enough data in each uh, form. so. Yes, it doesn't really, like currently it does matter that you're using uh, stereo imagery, but in a future where you have enough information, like enough photos, it doesn't matter. Is it? Yes. So the next time you go to a dating site, you may be able to find the DNA profile of your potential fake. Oh. That's really scary. That was a, so the, the note, the comment was about dating and how you can actually uh, genetically discriminate against your dates. <laughs> Sounds like a startup idea, guys. <laughs> yes? So if STR only uses 13 sites, doesn't that make it a lot cheaper if, all, if you know that the police are going to use 
STR to image the DNA? So the thing about STR is that they're looking at 13 particular sites. And it is not just uh, SNP reads, but it's like, it's not single reads, but it's multiple reads of sticky ends of DNA. And the way that works is that you have uh, an enzyme, and an enzyme will cut at a particular uh, string of DNA, and then figure out, you'll figure out like the lengths of all these cuts in order to describe what the identity of this person is. So you're, like even if you only, so I think what you're getting at in your question, his question was about STR and how it's only 13 sites, and how maybe you could only like affect these 13 sites and it'd be very cheap, but any sort of perturbation beyond the 13 sites or any sort of difference beyond the 13 sites might accidentally get cut by these enzymes and then it'll be in the read. Yeah. Um, that's with any sort of like restriction enzyme digest that like even if you affect certain places where you think it's gonna cut, the other variation might not be enough. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is everyone scared? Yes? Uh, in terms of like the DNA at a crime, uh, compared to their testing, would you actually need to have an exact match of someone's DNA? No, you don't. Okay, so this is really, this is really effed up. So um, when I read it, I was like, oh my god. Um, so the question was about whether you need a perfect match in order to implicate someone in crime. And the answer is no, because oftentimes the sequencing has high enough variation and enough errors that, you know, good enough is good enough, uh, unfortunately. Yep. So even if it's 13 sites, they might only need, like, 10 to like implicate you in a crime? Yes? Can you, if you have a good enough lawyer, uh, request a better DNA uh, test? So like, let's say uh, I'm implicated for a murder that my brother did. Sure. <laughs> he goes to jail instead of me. Uh huh. Is there a way to go get my own test and submit it as evidence, or do we have to use what the government uses? So the question was about how you can, in court of law, get a better genetic test in order to get higher fidelity, uh, like matching for the crime. And it, it might come down to Mr. Brimley's point of money. Um, and I, I'm not quite sure how the courts handle that exactly. Um, any comments from the audience? Any lawyers? Yes. Um, so I think, I mean, in that case, you're trying to prove the error prove the government wrong. So I think that a big issue that actually comes up is um, can I get access to this and look at what they use and look at the test? And oh. So the answer is that the, the it comes down to proving the government wrong and you might not be able to get you the tests. Did I? Did I? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Paraphrasing. Nice. How do you get access to the Yeah. Uh, did you did you hear that answer? Or a was bit. it oh, okay? So to clarify, it comes down to how the court proceeds and how your, what your access is to whatever genetic test they had. Right? Yes, maybe. Huh? <laughs> so that could vary by state. Yeah, potentially. Shit. I know. <laughs> I mean, it looks like California sort of has some stuff like this. This is a uh, this guy. This is pretty good. How smart's your brother? Yep. Another question. Yeah. So last year there was a FBI director that was in here giving a talk about how the genetic sequencing in these uh, sites by 23andMe are used, and that a lot of this is outsourced to foreign firms that don't fall under a lot of these, uh, you know, rules and regulations. And oh. it was suggested that the Chinese have made heavy investments in DNA to outsource DNA testing from international sources. Okay, so the comment was about, it was a comment, not a question, right? Maybe? Well, it's just like, how does this affect the legality of things? Is there any protection? Is there no hope? <laughs> I'm, not qu I'm not an expert on international law, so I can't answer that question. The question was about how, uh, how you would litigate in an international off-source. How it should be regulated. How it should be regulated. Sourcing of DNA analysis. You want your sample from 23 and Me to be sent off to a, a foreign lab. Yeah. Well, currently in certain like clinical um, settings, you can't export any DNA. And then for government regulations, like in China, for example, you can't export any genetic information. Or if you do, what they do in China is they take 
the like server that has all the genetic information or the hard drive, and they ship it over, and they send over like uh, some sort of Chinese custodian who will watch you as you do whatever genetic analysis, and they'll like take this device back because they don't trust any sort of like uh, FTP or whatever. Um, yeah, isn't that funny? Like, if you're having a coordination between China and Canada, they'll like fly over this like giant machine with like, you know, someone who like custodians it and like watches you. <laughs> yep, super safe though, I guess. Yes, that question. Do you know is there um, any attempt that the Supreme Court is going to hear the California Act? Have you heard anything about that? Oh, with the Golden State Killer. No, no, no. I know, like, the California Act was upheld by the California Supreme Court. Yes. Have you heard of anything about the U.S. Supreme Court hearing the case? With, with a set of state standards? Uh, I had a note about this. Carpenter versus the United States, that the police needed a warrant uh, to obtain information on the location of an individual and phones uh, from a phone company. So I think it has been upheld, maybe. I'm not quite sure what it upheld. My notes are not that clear. <laughs> but there is some stuff happening federally. Yes. <laughs> no, it's correct. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, OK, sorry I'm not an expert of law. I'm just a computational biologist who has a lot of paranoia. OK. Uh -huh. Any other questions, comments? One last one. Then. Sure. What about your brother? We're gonna get there. Uh, <laughs> you take that data and make three representations to falsify video eventually. Oh, okay. So taking genetic information and turning it into facial information, right? Yeah. Like, hey, I need to make this person look, say, Korean. That is extremely difficult because um, from the sequencing information, there's not a lot of, for whatever reason, the mapping is not like equally equal both ways. That like if you're going from genetic information to facial information, there are a couple of different things. Like one, your face is weathered by whatever you've experienced in your life, and it's not reflected in your genetic nor epigenetic information to a certain degree. And then like two, the like whatever sequencing you're using usually is not d high depth enough to like account for whatever error to accurately represent your face. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>